thank you. So uh, when I was last here on stage two or three years ago, I w spoke a lot about how games redefine entertainment. I think what you just heard from Andrew from Seriously is, is very much along these, those lines. My mission was to challenge the game developers in Finland and the rest of Europe to, to start thinking about their businesses as being entertainment businesses rather than simply game studios. I'm back here now. I was an investor back then. I'm back here now as an entrepreneur, um, founder and CEO of Refresh, an esports platform. So what we're doing now is starting to look at the businesses, the business of running competitive gaming. How do we take the gaming businesses that people like Andrew build and push into the, the, the realm of competitive sports? So this is probably the most typical notion of what esports looks like. A school gym, mostly boys, a single girl here and there, pizza, energy drinks, chips, and of course also a lot of fun. This is, things are at a tipping point. This is a tournament that we just had this past weekend in Copenhagen, uh, 12 and a half thousand attendees. I hope it's running yet. 12 and a half thousand attendees coming in for a 10 hour stretch. We had two and a half million unique viewers on Twitch, 2.4 million unique viewers on Imba TV, uh, one of the large Chinese streaming services. And we were broadcast in 80 territories in 15 different languages. These are some of the very biggest stars who show up. They, they come, they compete, and really, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, there's, there's nothing like it. It is an extremely intense sport. You have 15-year-olds, you have 10-year-olds, you have 40-year-olds standing there, you know, spilling their guts for their team. Bringing people to an esports event like this for the first time is often quite an eye opener. Um, seeing the intensity of, of the crowd, seeing the intensity of the audience uh, is something quite different. And this is really what we believe is going to be one of the most powerful spectator events and TV or online viewing opportunities in the next couple of years. So during this, during this final, or actually during this day, it was broadcast on, on DR, the Danish Public Service Channel. And they broadcast for all 10 hours. The ratings, we've only gotten the linear TV ratings back at this point. Uh, they hit the top ever in the age group of 15 to 39 years. Sorry, yes, 15 to 39 year olds. 14.8% of all Danes in that age bracket, male and female, were watching those uh, were watching those games at any given point. And a Brazilian team went with the championship. So a little bit on the, on the ecosystem. Um, you know, this is very much a sport which has been invented from behind the closed doors in, in a teenage room. Uh, we have stars now who are rivaling the biggest football stars, the biggest basketball stars in social media followership. Um, they're represented by teams. Um, a few of the traditional sports teams like uh, PSG in Paris are getting into this, but mostly these are brand new brands. Astralis, Fnatic, SK, teams that haven't existed in, in anything else before. The teams are now starting to introduce uh, the lifestyle of a pro athlete, mental training, the top 
esports psychologist is actually a Finn. Um, they are starting to get physical training, nutrition, practice regimes, sleep patterns, and et cetera. And then we have where the real battle is being held right now. It's the leagues. Um, E-League by IMG and Turner in the US. ESL owned by Swedish MTG. Ourselves as a newcomer. And on top of that, we have the broadcasters. So the example of DR starting to show it, Turner showing it, the online OTTs, Twitch, Hitbox, YouTube. But then we also have a very different thing than from traditional sports. We actually have the, the, the one who owns the basketball, so to say, if, if the same had happened in basketball. The game developers, like Riot with League of Legends, like Valve with uh, Dota 2 and Counter-Strike, and Blizzard with Overwatch and Hearthstone. So these guys come in and they can actually, for, for them it's very much a, a symbiotic relationship of starting to get these viewers and getting the players to watch other people play, brings in new players and, and, uh, and heightens retention. Further down the, uh, the stack, you have a lot of monetization happening from entirely different types of activities. There's uh, marketplaces for trading skins in-game. There's game servers for playing the multiplayer uh, setups with your teams. There's a private casting on YouTube, where, uh, YouTube and Twitch where people are entertaining, much like other YouTubers are. And finally, there's, of course, the betting and, and fantasy leagues uh, happening. The revenue is still pretty low for, uh, for most of these sports. Uh, esports is at, at about three to four dollars per esports fan per year right now, compared to NBA, NFL, uh, where it's up at a, a fifty to sixty dollar range. But also that's changing quite quickly. At the tournament this weekend, we sold about two thousand player jerseys of about fifty euros a, a pop, and the overall merchandise spend per guest was about ten euros. And the and the fan base is growing extremely rapidly. And most interestingly enough, it's actually the casual fan base. So those of us who don't play the games ourselves, but enjoy watching them. Um, and they're growing so fast that we're starting to surpass at least many of the US sports. We're still very far away from something like football, European football, soccer. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the old American sports like baseball, like ice hockey, are already being surpassed. And then we saw this thing in, in, uh, in Copenhagen this past weekend with DR, the public broadcaster. And here for their demographic, their core group on DR3, which is their youth channel, they surpassed the Olympics. They surpassed the X Games, which is otherwise really the, the group's, de the demographic's core uh, sports. And they even surpassed the Eurovision uh, sent on, on that channel. So this was, I think, for the first time that we really saw on national TV the power uh, that eSports has. If we look a little bit on, on the demographic, it's, there are two interesting points. Of course, we have a mass of new young players and viewers coming in every year. But it's not as skewed. Oh, I clicked back, sorry. It's not as skewed as, as, as we anticipate. Um, the, uh, the demographic above 20 years represents about 70% of all the viewers. And also on the female side, it's, it's almost one third, which is constantly a surprise to anybody who makes their way into the sport, whether that's a viewer themselves or if this is, uh, are these some of the brands that have started working, whether this is the Audis, whether this is the Virgins, uh, or even whether this is the, the Red Bulls. It's a very affluent population. Um, there are fewer that are unemployed, and generally they're higher earners than anywhere else in, uh, on, of the internet population. Uh, even talking to high-end consultancies in Denmark, whether that's a McKinsey or Deloitte or Price Waterhouse, they're massively looking to recruit from this group. Many are technically adept, of course, but also within these companies, they've seen that their high performers uh, are all esports, either former esports players or fanatics 
um, at this point. So looking a little bit more at, at the user also, this is, 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 a, is, a, is a younger example. This is my 15-year-old son. Um, he, in the past week, has played a roughly 35 hours, sorry, past two weeks, roughly 40, 35 hours, which is probably about the same time he goes to school. Um, he has invested in skins. Skins in Counter-Strike have absolutely no functional value. You, do not, you cannot shoot uh, better. Uh, you cannot uh, have more impact. This is entirely visual. He has, pu has put together an inventory of about 430 euros. And uh, what's more interesting, also even more interesting, is that this is uh, his data consumption uh, in the past 30 days. So massive, massive use of YouTube, massive use of Twitch, massive use of all the other uh, digital video services out there. They're, they're twice as, as uh, likely to have Netflix subscriptions, three times as like, more likely to have Spotify subscriptions than the average internet user. So from the brand's perspectives, these are definitely users that they want to get a hold of. So just to wrap things up, a little bit of sort of my, my own personal history in this. Uh, I was involved with Mojang, the creators of Minecraft, back in 2010. And we were solidly happy about all the traffic, all the new users that YouTube was sending our way. And then suddenly in 2013, we started looking really into the numbers. And what we saw was that it was actually no longer YouTube driving Minecraft. It was Minecraft driving YouTube. Minecraft videos had become, at that point, the second most viewed category by minutes in all of YouTube, surpassing even, even music, sorry, second only to music videos. So I think really the end of this is for the game developers, for the investors, and for you as other entrepreneurs, not just to look at the gamers, not just look at the creators who are creating the content for Twitch, for YouTube, et cetera, but this mass new block, which is the viewers. And these people might never be playing the games. They might only simply be enjoying it uh, from the perspective of being a, a viewer. Thank you.